Hey everyone and welcome back to the channel. You know, today we're prepping for a storm here in the Northeast, and what better way to stay warm than with a heaping helping of animated gore? Know about you, but seeing a monster get vivisected just gives me a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling deep within my bowels. And while I'm not talking about some of the more infamous and super violent OVAs out there, uh, today's subject has a respectable amount of splatter. It has gibs and uh, back boils that would make Dr. Pimple Popper blush. And before we really get into the thick of things, let me just say if the voiceover today seems a little bit low energy, uh, it's because I got a nice old case of COVID for Christmas. So uh, just uh, imagine me cutting out the uh, gasping for air <laughs> as I run out of breath at the end of the sentences while reading the script today. So uh, uh, thank you for putting up with that. As a property, the Giver has a more expansive history than I originally thought. While this video is covering the OVA released between 1989 and 1992, the original source material is a manga that started in 1985, written and illustrated by Yoshiki Takaya. The manga was kicked around between a few magazines in the 80s and spawned an OVA movie called The Giver Out of Control. This movie only covered the first few volumes of the manga and was quickly followed up by today's series, The Giver Bio Booster Armor. This 12 episode, two season show followed the source material more closely than the movie, though it still took quite a few liberties with the story structure. There was also a 25 episode TV anime released in 2005 called Giver the Bio Boosted Armor, and of course two early 90s American movie adaptations, one which starred Mark Hamill. Oh yeah, then the sequel movie called Giver Dark Hero had David Hayter in it, which is always pretty cool. I don't know much about these live action movies other than a very faint memory of seeing the first one on the sci-fi channel when I was a kid, but if you think I should give them a look on this channel, let me know down below. The Giver was released in the United States in 1992 on God's multimedia format, VHS. Looking at the cover of Volume 1 makes me feel some kind of way, man. I mean, look at that gradient and lime green text that is nearly unreadable because of the fucking yellow background. I can smell the 90s through the computer screen. I think it is worth noting that this terrible box art was only on the original US renditions run of the tape, and later on it was re-released by Manga Video with some great cover art. I mean, I would be proud to hang some of those VHS covers on my wall as a poster. Yeah, I guess I should mention there is a dub for the Giver, but it is terrible. Honestly, it makes me feel a little bit bad for making fun of Misuzu's voice actor for the Gasaraki video because this is something else. Sho, what did you say? Tell me again. I said I'm going to tell these guys about the things we saw and maybe they can help. We can't keep it to ourselves. Ha 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 ha. So what is it you boys think you're going to tell me? About men who could turn into monsters or something like that? <laughs> So yeah, I watched the original Japanese audio on this one. So let's take a look at the Giver Bio Booster Armor. The series opens with this guy with a briefcase scrambling through the woods looking like he just got beat to hell. He contacts someone on a phone saying that he can't take it anymore and is instructed to deliver the briefcase to an undisclosed location the next day. A little bit later, he just sort of wanders into the street and gets full on hit by a truck. The driver gets out only to find the briefcase, but no mangled corpse and thinks to himself, well, he probably got isekai so I, I may as well steal his shit, immediately taking the case and putting it in the vehicle. Before he can leave with his booty, it is revealed that the crazy guy has transformed into a hideous monster and destroys the truck. The next day at school, we get to meet our main character, Sho Fukumachi. Sho is an upright high school student who is presented as a generally good person and who takes part in the student council. He discusses a traffic accident that he saw on the news this morning with his friends Tetsuro and Mizuki Sagawa. 
Sho has to run off to the student council meeting, and it's shown to us that he doesn't even really like the student council and only joined because he has a huge crush on Mizuki, and she's very passionate about it. Tetsuro is the biggest bro about Sho liking his sister too, which will expand to just being one of the best anime friends slash sidekicks from this era. Tetsuro and Sho part ways, but plan on hanging out in the nearby woods after school. Hey, it was the late 80s, what else were kids supposed to do for fun? Hopefully it's not the same woods where a group of strangely outfitted men are currently chasing down the scary monster man, who's named Malmot, by the way. They chase the guy down and he transforms, but it turns out that the soldiers can transform as well, and one of them named Gregol does just that. The two monsters fight, and Malmot seems like he's not very good at it. Poor guy. Gregol demands to know where the Giver unit is, and tells him that uh, not only is he weak, he's stupid, because Zoonoids cannot survive outside of Kronos' headquarters for more than a week. Now that's a lot of proper nouns that the show does not want to explain right away, but we learn that the transforming monsters named Zoonoids are being created by a shadowy organization named Kronos. Malmot realizes that he's been tricked by whoever was on the other side of the phone, and one of the soldiers finds the Giver unit, which was just kinda hidden under a bush. So in a fit of rage, he rushes the soldier and fucking explodes, revealing that he had hidden a bomb inside his stomach. The explosion causes the Giver unit to blast into three pieces, revealing that it was actually three separate devices all along. One of the chunks soars through the air and lands right next to Sho and Tetsuro. The soldier's day goes from bad to worse as Gregol realizes that he was wounded during the explosion and now cannot change back to human form, so he goes nuts and runs off into the forest. Sho is a little overly curious, and when he approaches the object, it activates and wraps him in a bunch of tendrils, causing him to fall into a nearby pond and not resurface. Tessero yells for help, but the only person that shows up is Gregol in full monster form. The soldiers watch on and decide just to let Gregor kill the kids, since they don't want any loose ends. Suddenly, Sho bursts from the water, clad in the armor of the Giver. Sho easily destroys Gregol's arms and then twists his head, killing him. All of the soldiers run away, except for their commander, a guy named Vamor, who transforms into a hulking vampire bat monster. Vamor has big ol' shoulder laser cannons and explains that zoonoid weapons are a part of their body. They are the perfect weapon. But then his shoulder lasers could never stand up to the Giver's, uh titty lasers? A weapon called the Mega Smasher that blows Vamor into smithereens and cuts a smoking swath through the forest. The armor sheds itself from Sho and looks sort of like a ghost or a spirit, and then it lowers itself back into the pond. Now this leaves Sho and Tetsuro to figure out just what the hell is going on, but at least they're the only two people that know that Sho is the Giver. Oh well, and the student council president who's watching creepily from the bushes, which is something that people really like to do in this show. And also his dad is the head of Kronos Japan, and every time we see him, he looks like the most stressed out person on the planet. He's about to be even more stressed out as a blonde, muscular man named Lisker arrives intent on recovering the missing Giver device before anything else can go wrong. Lisker goes to the lab where the recovered units are kept, revealing that there are three in total and, much like Sho, he is overwhelmed by the device's tendrils. Lisker now has his own set of shiny Giver armor and kills off some low-level zoonoids as a test, saying that they're no match for the missing unit and that he'll have to do it himself. Sho is actually feeling pretty good, besides having a fever. Well, and also having these giant, disgusting boils on his back. He shows them to Tetsuro, who's like, uh, maybe you should go to a dermatologist. Despite not wanting to get involved with the monstrous zoonoids, Sho finds himself wondering if the strange device he found is still at the lake. After school, he and Tetsuro are approached by two cops who tell them that they need to question them about the explosion in the woods the other day. Sho, being trustworthy and 
maybe more than a bit naive, takes Tetsuro and goes along with them, only for them to quickly reveal that they aren't police officers at all. They're taken to a construction site, or abandoned building, apparently it's both, I don't know, where Lisker has his two goons interrogate them. Not having any reason to lie, the boys tell Lisker that the device is still in the lake, but he doesn't believe them as they already searched the area thoroughly. Sho and Tetsuro don't know that the device has completely like combined with Sho and is no longer at the bottom of the pond. Lisker demonstrates his ruthlessness by ordering one of the Zoonoids to bite off Sho's arm, but before he gets his snack, Sho yells GYVER and blows the guy away. The Giver armor forms on Sho's body, seemingly reacting to his call, and I gotta say, it is pretty badass. The music that goes along with the Giver transformation and anytime he's the main focus of the action really drives home just how fun this series is. The show is silly and it, the animation isn't revolutionary, but anytime Sho is fighting big hairy monsters, I just want to pump my fist in the air. The Zoonoids are no match for Sho and he easily dispatches them. They melt in a pretty gross and spectacular fashion too, which I really appreciate. Lisker transforms into the very creatively named Giver 2 and tells Sho that a Giver is a human that has fused with an alien creature. The disc on his forehead is known as a control metal, a device that keeps the alien from completely overtaking its human host. Lisker says there's no way that Sho can beat him because he knows how to use the armor to its fullest extent, and then he grows some pretty cool arm blades. When Sho is cornered, he is also able to summon these arm blades as the bio booster unit has self-preservation as a basic function, and as the two fight, Sho is able to damage the control metal on Lisker's head. Sho then punches it off completely, and this causes the bio booster to feed on its human host. Lisker starts to melt in a really impressively disgusting display, and then Sho blasts him with the Mega Smasher, which is probably overkill, but hey, it's cool points. Once again, the student council president, Agito Makishima, watches from the bushes. Maybe he's a voyeur? It turns out that Makishima Sr. has a reason to look so stressed out, as a higher up from Kronos HQ named Commander Rayhelt Gyo shows up. Gyo is where you go, oh, this show's not trying to be subtle at all. He looks like Donald Trump had sex with Emperor Palpatine in a McDonald's bathroom. He tells Makishima that if he doesn't get control of the Giver situation, then he will be fired. And the severance package is terrible, if you catch my drift. Makishima has a final gambit up his sleeve, a so-called hyperzoanoid named Zer Barbus, that is supposedly many times stronger than its more common brethren. Agito tells his father not to worry, as there's another option, using Sho's friends to lure him into a trap. Sho keeps having nightmares and daydreams about melting into a puddle of goo, and this gives me an excuse to talk about the show's body horror. Body horror is a subgenre that is incredibly hit or miss among most people. Either it fascinates you or you don't want to look at it at all. Something about your own physical being, the meat and bones that make you, well, you, transforming into another form beyond your control is a horrifying concept. The 1980s remake of The Thing is one of my favorite movies of all time, and The Fly is up there as well, so I found The Giver to be pretty interesting in that aspect. Sho goes through the anxiety of having an alien organism bonded to him, with the only thing keeping it from feeding on him completely being a piece of technology that he doesn't even understand. On top of that, he's growing boils on his back that look like popcorn at 10 times scale, and it all just adds up to this atmosphere of uneasy dread. The Giver is a really fun action adventure series, but the body horror layered on top of it adds a little spice that I appreciate. Sho's pretty depressed because he doesn't want Mizuki to think he's a freak, and she isn't an idiot, so she can tell something is wrong. You know, that is one thing that I do like about the Giver. Mizuki is not completely useless, despite not having any special powers, and yes, being a damsel in distress at multiple points, Mizuki does factor into the main group in more ways than one. While she is the love interest for Sho, she's also his emotional core and linked to reality when things get really bad. I just watched through Gundam Age where every main female character is only there because the concept of the show requires the lead to have a kid for the next arc. 
even if they are a block of wood. So seeing a female love interest that isn't incredibly annoying or terribly written is a nice surprise. Good job, Guyver. Tetsuro tries to comfort Sho, and I have to say again, Tetsuro is such a good guy. If half the Gundam protagonists had friends half as cool as him, the Universal Century wouldn't have so many problems. The two see some Zoonoids kidnapping Mizuki and chase after them, but Sho is hesitant to transform in front of his crush. Tetsuro trips and breaks his glasses and yells that Sho has to save his sister while laying there on the ground. I don't know, this part is just really funny to me. Like, he didn't get shot or anything, he just sort of fell over. Sho realizes he needs to use the power of the Giver, so he transforms and chases the vehicle to a warehouse. When he enters, he's surrounded by a bunch of Zoonoids who all start fighting the Giver at once. We do get a reveal of Giver 3, aka the Dark Giver, observing from the shadows, and we know that Akito has been transformed into the alien entity. Giver 3 looks fucking awesome, by the way. Such a great and edgy 80s design for a monster. Along with his arm blades, Sho can now use a really cool green laser that he shoots from his head, and he realizes that the control metal is helping defend him. Zerababus finally joins the fray and is much stronger than the normal Zoonoids, matching Sho blow for blow. Sho sees a corpse hanging from the ceiling and knocks it onto the Hyper Zoonoid as a distraction and then knees him in the face. This actually almost kills Zerababus and he runs off into the warehouse, planning on grabbing Mizuki to use her as a human shield. When he busts into the room, he finds Mizuki's guards all dead. Giver 3 then kills Zerababus in front of Sho, and tells him that one day they'll meet again. Why did Agito betray his father's plan? Is he really working for Kronos, or was getting his hands on the Giver unit his true plan all along? The Giver doesn't answer that right away, and it's a lot of fun on the first viewing to try and figure out what Agito's angle really is. The show does a really good job at getting you to trust him just a little bit, and then reminding you that he might just betray everybody at the most opportune moment. Mikishima is dragged off by Gyo's henchmen as the commander reveals that Zerberbus was pathetic and his men are the real hyperzoanoids. We get a pretty good reveal when Gyo talks to Agito and is like, huh, so uh, you don't care that I just killed your dad? And Agito says, nope, it's all good because Makishima Sr. wasn't his real father anyway and he was raised as an agent of Kronos. Man, this company is <laughs> really messed up. Gyo thinks that Agito having no emotional ties makes him a perfect candidate as a future Kronos commander and decides to keep the young man close. Meanwhile, Sho and Tetsuro come up with a plan to expose Kronos to the world. Tetsuro knows this guy named Mr. Takasato, a former alumni at their school and current reporter for a big newspaper. They go to the office and Takasato doesn't really believe that there are giant alien monster men running around, so Sho just transforms into the Giver right in the middle of their office with everyone watching. While this interests the reporters and Takasato says he will think about looking into this Kronos organization. As the two kids leave the office, the suite fucking explodes, and I mean right after they leave too. Kronos has such a wide reach that they can bomb a newspaper HQ within five minutes of them getting information. Gyo is now really paranoid about Sho and Tetsuro leaking information to outside parties, so he puts Agito in charge of the plan to attack the school. The Zoonoids that will participate in this operation are known as the Hyper Zoonoid Team 5. Each member is much stronger than the run-of-the-mill Zoonoid, and they have their own unique attributes as well. Just as they arrive at the school to begin the attack, it starts to rain, and I just have to say that I really love the atmosphere of the Giver. Anytime we get a stormy episode in a TV show, it's a fun feeling, and the Giver does it especially well. The Hyperzoanoid team attacks the school, bombarding it with laser blasts from a nearby hill and also fireballs. One of the monsters has electric powers, which causes the lights and electronics in the building to start sparking and blowing out. Overall, a pretty crazy experience. Sho and Mizuki are both on the roof of the school, where Sho plans on telling Mizuki the truth behind everything happening. Before he can finally spill the beans, they see three classmates in the courtyard below being cornered. 
Sho then jumps off the roof, which must traumatize Mizuki a bit because she does not know that he can survive the fall. He transforms on the way down and saves the students, but Sho severely underestimates how much more powerful the hyperzoonoids are and gets smacked around a bit. Sho is almost killed by fire, but one of the other zoonoids named Zan Cruz steps in and says they don't want to damage the control metal, so they're just going to cut off his head instead. Sho realizes that he can't beat them, but decides to keep fighting anyway until he's saved by the intervention of Giver 3. Giver 3 kills Zan Cruz and advises Sho on how to kill Guster, the fire zoonoid. The two Givers can apparently telepathically communicate through the organisms on their backs, making it easy for them to coordinate in battle. Gyo realizes that the third Giver unit is working against Kronos, though he does not know who is wearing the armor and orders the remaining hyperzoonoids to retreat. So if you thought attacking the school would kind of blow the lid off of the whole Kronos thing to the general public, well think again because the organization is able to wipe everyone's memories with drugs and hypnosis. Yes, there are only a few students and staff in the building because it was later in the day, but you do just sort of have to accept that Kronos can sort of just do anything it wants. If I had to pick my least favorite aspect of the story, it's that Kronos does all this stuff off screen. It really is like a wizard did it levels of hand waving, and I can definitely see how that could annoy somebody. Besides giving the local children amnesia, Gyo has been working on a brand new zoonoid. This creature, codenamed Enzyme, is specifically built to be able to counter the Giver's armor with corrosive claws. And just for some extra fun, it's also Agito's dad. Speaking of Agito, he corners Sho in an empty classroom and tells him that his efforts against Kronos are futile, seemingly blowing his own cover. He says that Kronos has agents in all levels of the police and government, and there's no one who can help Sho. He also lets Sho know that Tetsuro and Mizuki were both kidnapped that morning and taken to the woods where they originally found the bio booster to be executed. Sho then punches Agito right in the face, and Agito no-sells the punch, causing Sho to run off. It's actually pretty funny. Sho runs to the forest as quick as he can and finds the remaining three hyperzoonoids holding his friends hostage. Makashima stumbles out of the bushes looking like a drunk and then has a really good transformation sequence and becomes the huge moth bear thing named Enzyme. Sho realizes he'll have to fight this monster at a distance when it starts dissolving his armor and he uses this really cool gravity ball attack. He also punches Enzyme's arm clean off giving us that patented Giver gore in this episode. This attack, no matter how cool, isn't enough to finish off Enzyme and the monster goes arm for an arm. The loss of a limb is enough of a distraction that Enzyme is able to rip the control metal off of Sho's head, which causes the bio booster to start feeding on him just like it did with Lisker. Gyo tells Enzyme to detonate himself in a similar fashion to Malmot back in episode 1, and the gore covers the writhing show, reducing him down to nothing more than a puddle of goo. This is not one of those shows that tries to trick you into thinking the protagonist is dead. He's literally melted into a puddle. Show is fucking dead. And Agito watches from the shadows once again, having a little chuckle to himself. You gotta give it to the Giver, you know, not a lot of shows would have the balls to kill off their main character on screen in such a brutal fashion. The captured Tetsuro and Mizuki are brought before Gyo, and Agito reveals that he's been working for Kronos all along. But then right after that, he has a moment when he's alone in the elevator where he's like, mm, yes, all of my evil pieces of my plan are falling into place. So, we still really don't know who Agito works for, if anyone, other than himself. This is where Gyo tells Tetsuro and Mizuki that Kronos is working to complete the evolution of humanity, and that by creating powerful zonoids and sending them out to all corners of the globe, they can usher in a golden age. Tetsuro and Mizuki both cry out for show, and in a surprising turn, we see the control metal in the Kronos lab start to resonate and grow some sort of organic tissue. Agito actually helps out by knocking out the two scientists guarding the control metal, and then he goes to Tetsuro's cell. He tells the two prisoners that he is a double agent, trying to destroy Kronos from the inside, and then proves it by transforming into Giver 3 and bending the bars of their cell so that they can escape. 
MacGyver is completely rebuilt from scratch, which shocks the guards as they rush in. Sho wastes no time breaking out of the lab and wreaking havoc inside the Kronos Japan building, his control metal being in complete defensive mode, making him deadly and efficient. Sho kills Darzeb, one of the remaining hyperzoonoids, by throwing him out of a window and then takes another one out off camera. Agito runs into Zektor, the beetle-like leader of the hyperzoonoids, and battles him, but Sho is in destroy mode and just bursts through a wall to join the fight. The giant beetle escapes from the two Guyvers, and because Sho is still in self-preservation mode, he immediately attacks Agito. It takes a combination of Agito mentally resonating with the control metal and Mizuki calling out to Sho to bring him back to his senses. The Guyvers make their way to the control room and confront Commander Gyo, who divulges the history behind the Zonoids and Bio Boosters. He reiterates that humans are only a step in evolution, but this time we learn that humanity was originally engineered by an alien species called the Descended Ones. We were created to be the perfect warrior to fight in our alien master's galactic conquests until one day when the aliens mysteriously left. But Kronos found ancient ruins full of information and bioengineering labs and decided to carry on their work, eventually creating the Zoonoids. The building starts to explode because of Agito's sabotage and a supercharged Zektor shows up to fight the Guyvers. After absorbing the power of the electric zoonoid Elegan, Zektor is so powerful that the two Guyvers can't touch him. It takes the combined powers of two Mega Smashers to blow the monster away. The building completely collapses and we get a shot of Gyo falling into the rubble, presumably to his death. Mizuki and Tetsuro are worried that the two Guyvers were killed in the building's collapse, but then Sho floats down from the sky unharmed. Well, mostly unharmed, his armor is pretty messed up. Mizuki apologizes to Sho for being weirded out that he's a scary alien man, and the first half of the Guyver comes to a close, though the audience gets the feeling that things are only beginning. The story picks back up a short time later, as an attempted kidnapping on the Sagawas is foiled by the two Guyvers. The Kronos soldiers are pissed and wonder why the Guyvers are always one step ahead, revealing that anyone who knew Agito's identity is dead. Oh, also the Guyvers can fly now, apparently, but they barely use such a useful power, which is kind of a letdown. Sho's father is now home, he was apparently away on business, but he and Sho are immediately made the target of schemes from the newly revealed leader of all of Kronos Japan, Dr. Balkus. Balkus is an old man with a gem implanted in his forehead and a top scientist of the organization, not to mention he has incredible psychic powers. While at school, they overhear that the factory that Sho's father works in was destroyed in a giant explosion, and there were no survivors. Of course, Sho doesn't know that this is just a cover-up to kidnap his father, but since there were presumably no remains, they move on and have a funeral. The passage of time in this episode is really strange. I'm assuming that Sho and the Sagawas thought that Kronos had been defeated and some time has passed. Uh, otherwise, they're just kind of dumb. Uh, Mizuki is kidnapped by Kronos agents at the funeral. Man, I'm wondering why they ever go anywhere alone. Sho receives a phone call telling him to come to the Riverside Park if he ever wants to see his friends alive again. Man, let the kid grieve his exploded father for a second, damn. When Sho arrives, Kronos soldiers handcuff him to Mizuki so that he can't transform without killing her. One of the soldiers starts beating Sho, but then we get the introduction of the coolest character in all of the Giver, a man named Misaki Murakami, with flowing locks and the self-confidence to never take off his sunglasses. He blasts the Zoonoid from long range with a huge gun that is emblazoned with the words, Max Factory Zoonoid Buster Custom. Mr. Shade starts blasting Zoonoids left and right while Sho struggles with his restraints. Mizuki reveals that she's actually not Mizuki at all and is really a Zoonoid in disguise. Now, knowing this, Sho just transforms and obliterates the attached monster, so uh, yeah, that was a pretty bad plan on his part. I do have to wonder, why not actually use the real Mizuki for this? Because like, as soon as Sho figures out that it's not, he will transform. 
I don't know, it just seems like a lot of extra work to create a Zoonoid copy of Mizuki to trick show when you have the real one in prison. Murakami can also figure out when someone's a Zoonoid before they even transform, and this is where the show just really becomes two kids throwing action figures at each other. I mean that in the best way possible. The Giver is just really fun when it comes to action and design, and since it's only a loose adaptation of the manga anyway, they may as well have some fun with it. The first half of the show was really focused on the mystery of Kronos and the bio boosters, while the second half is more focused on action and show learning to deal with his circumstances. Show is able to funnel a bunch of the Zoonoids into a single line and then blast them with the Mega Smasher. Not to be outdone, Murakami uses some psychic powers to freeze a Zoonoid in place, but it is killed by Sho before his powers can be fully revealed. Murakami even acts like Sho saved his life in order to preserve his secret, and tells him that Mizuki and Mr. Fukumachi are all being held in a Kronos facility at Mount Minakami. Of course, Dr. Balkus with his psychic powers realizes that the Giver and two companions are headed his way, so he sends out a team of special prototype Zoonoids called the Lost Unit to capture or eradicate them. Now, the Lost Unit is pretty similar to the Hyper Zoonoid Team 5, a team of special ops monsters dispatched to destroy the Giver. I personally think the Lost Unit is more interesting and have more diverse powers and personalities. Hell, half of the Hyperzoanoid team didn't even have personalities. But it is such a similar plot point that it does seem like a missed opportunity to expand the world. But hey, the Giver also uses kidnapping Sho's friends as a plot point every other episode, so what do you want? One of the Lost Unit can melt and take the appearance of his surroundings, so he causes Murakami's car to get stuck in his mud which sounds really gross. Sho fights against three of the Zoonoids and luckily Tetsuro and Murakami are saved by an old man with a shotgun who sort of randomly shows up. Sho has a hard time fighting off the new Zoonoids with their strange powers. One of them, named Aptum, is even able to transform into a being that looks shockingly similar to the Giver. It takes Murakami using his telepathic powers and blowing off Aptum's arm to turn the tables once more. Aptum is told telepathically to retreat by Dr. Balkus, and this leaves our heroes to retreat to the old man's cabin deeper into the forest. The man and his daughter Shisu explain that this is a safe house provided by Agito Makashima, and he'll be joining them shortly. Sho has a terrible dream about his father turning into a monster, and so he leaves the cabin in the middle of the night, not wanting to wait any longer to rescue his father and Mizuki. In the forest, Sho runs into Agito, who tells him that he'll come along to attack the Kronos site. While Sho and his friends have been tromping through the forest, his father has been under the experimental torture of Dr. Balkus, but he's also been kept in the same cell as Mizuki, and she's been able to fill him in on everything. Sho and Agito infiltrate the base while wearing Kronos soldier uniforms and find the prisoners, blowing a hole in the ceiling with the Mega Smasher to escape. Agito stays behind to slow down any pursuing Zoonoids, and this is where Balkis starts to finally figure out that Agito might be Giver 3. I guess he's a doctor and not a detective for a reason. In the forest, Sho's father receives a telepathic command and begins to change into the monstrous Enzyme 2, a far superior version of that original foe. Initially, Sho doesn't think that it is really his father because Kronos had used a fake Mizuki before, but when he looks into the monster's eyes, he sees that it truly is. Sho gets knocked around for a while because he doesn't want to fight his own father, and just before Enzyme 2 can kill Sho, Murakami appears and freezes him with psychic powers. Before long, it becomes a battle of the mind as Dr. Balkus overpowers Murakami and makes Enzyme rip off a chunk of Sho's head. At this point, with Sho's brain destroyed, the control metal goes into self-defense mode and assumes all control of the body. Without Sho's feelings for his father holding the Giver back, he makes relatively short work of Enzyme 2. Tetsuro screams for Sho to stop before he kills his father, but the control metal is only aiming to kill and completely obliterates the Zoonoid with the Mega Smasher. While the Bio Booster slowly repairs Sho's damaged brain, the others wonder how they will tell him what he's just done. 
Now, the Giver gets my respect for putting the main character through some real shit here. I mean, he already died once, but Sho's dad ain't coming back, and now he has to come to grips with the fact that he's not only a scary alien monster, but he also killed his own father. The group returns to the forest safe house in order to regroup and let Sho heal. Murakami believes that they should escape the area before Kronos finds them. The closest route out of the mountain forest is through a nearby village called Takashiro, and Agito says he will return to the Kronos base to help deter the pursuit team. Akito does return to the base and tries to tell Dr. Balkus to send his troops in the wrong direction, but Balkus has a brain, so he just attacks Agito with a bunch of zoonoids. Agito is finally forced to show his hand and transform into Giver 3, though he struggles against Aptom of the Lost Unit, who seems much stronger than before. Agito is able to escape the facility below the mountain, but is wounded by Aptom in the process. Unfortunately, that battle happens off screen, so that sucks. The main group makes it to Takashiro Village, but it's not long before we can tell something is seriously amiss. Suddenly, the people of the village start transforming into zoonoids at the psychic call of Dr. Balkus. And this is another example of how insanely overpowered Kronos is as an organization. Not only can they bomb a newspaper office like five minutes after the reporters learn of their existence, they can also just kidnap and transform the population of a small town. The villagers also seem pretty shocked when they all start to transform, so it appears Kronos was able to do this in secret somehow, which makes me wonder why they even need zoonoids in the first place. Sho finally wakes up when the car is picked up and shaken around, and he transforms to fight off the monsters. Before Sho can do any real damage, his bio booster deactivates and will no longer respond to his call. Murakami thinks this is because of Sho's mental anguish over his father. He has some sort of mental block that won't allow him to become the Giver. Sho not being able to transform does lead to this show's best action scene, in my opinion at least. Murakami freezes a group of Zoonoids until Shisu can rescue them with the car, and apparently Murakami is a total beast because he pistol whips a Zoonoid and knocks it the fuck out. He then jumps on top of the moving car, and as they speed away and almost flip over, he's able to push off the wall with his legs and keep them on course. Just think of the damage this guy could do if he wasn't holding back in order to not kill the innocent villagers. This is just the dumbest action scene in the show, and it's become my favorite because of that. Agito runs into them on the outskirts of the village and uses the Mega Smasher to destroy the pursuing Zoonoids. While the group initially yells at him for killing the villagers, he explains that once someone is transformed, there's no going back to normal, so killing them is a kindness from his perspective. Sho is trying to figure out why he can't bio boost, and while his friends are all trying to have a nice moment in the forest while eating and hiding from Kronos, there's an undertone of anxiety as the group wonders how to tell Sho about his father. And let me tell you, they should be anxious because Dr. Balkus is about to release his secret weapon. Ah, yes, my secret weapon. Three nude, bald men. No one could resist that. Agito and the rest of the group realize that Murakami knows more than he's letting on and ask him to tell them everything he knows. First, he tells of the creators and how they came to Earth and controlled the ecosystem for 250 million years, trying to create the perfect biological weapon, mankind. This is the reason we're so good at killing each other, apparently. Once the creators left Earth, the pure zoonoids they left behind intermingled with humanity and their bloodlines weakened. And apparently zoonoids are the origin behind myths for things like vampires and werewolves, and I just, I really like that little detail. Mizuki freaks out at hearing the origins of humanity, unable to believe that they were born to be weapons, and runs away. The bio booster is essentially an ancient set of alien power armor, and at some point the creators got really curious and used one on a human. The Giver that resulted was said to be many times stronger than expected, and was immune to being controlled by telepathy. Thus the aliens gave the human warrior its name, the Giver, meaning out of control. 
Aptum watches all of this from the bushes, and it is noted that since undergoing further experimentation, Aptum has become resistant to Dr. Balkus's telepathic powers, making him sort of a loose cannon. Sho runs off to catch Mizuki, and shortly after he leaves, the group is confronted by the three experiments released by Dr. Balkus. Agito battles the three enzyme-like experiments, but is quickly worn down by the beast's corrosive attacks. Murakami realizes he has no other choice and transforms into a purple and white Giver-like creature. He destroys the three Zoonoids, but it takes most of his energy and he passes out. Balkus is shocked, stating that there are only 12 Zoa Lords, such as himself, so whatever Murakami is, is impossible. Sho catches up with Mizuki in the forest, but the two are soon chased by a group of Zoonoids. They're saved by the arrival of Giver 3, but things quickly go awry when Sho realizes that this Giver 3 isn't Agito. Giver 3 returns to the form of Aptom, who is basically now a complete shape changer. Aptom has Mizuki captive and also says he knows why Sho can't bio-boost, finally telling him that he killed his own father. Aptom goes into such great detail that we get to watch all the old footage again, which is one of the only downsides that I really have with this OVA. At least in the last half of this show, uh, there are a few points where they use old footage for flashbacks that go on for way too long. You can definitely feel them saving on animation time. Sho can't bio-boost because deep down he doesn't want to become the monster that killed his father. Just like in Season 1 of Yu-Gi-Oh! where... You know what, I'm sorry, I'm just recovering lost Yu-Gi-Oh! memories again. Anyway, Aptum threatens to kill Mizuki and transforms into Enzyme. Sho still can't bio-boost, so he starts torturing Mizuki and rips her clothes off, and then he stabs Sho in the stomach. And just as our hero is about to pass out from blood loss, he's able to call on the Giver and stop Aptum from his killing blow. Aptum can become any Zoonoid he wishes by altering his genetic code, eventually becoming a giant monster and amalgamation of all Sho's former enemies. He can also regenerate incredibly quickly, putting his arm back on like Piccolo, and reforming a hole blasted clean through his torso with little trouble. Aptom damages Sho's arms so that he can't use the Mega Smasher, the one weapon that could obliterate him fully, but Sho is able to open his chest cavity and operate the weapon through sheer force of will. The blast is so big that even the Kronos base is damaged by it, and as Sho takes Mizuki back to the group in the forest, he promises to both himself and his father that fighting Kronos is now his destiny. And unfortunately, that is the end of the Giver, the Bio Booster Armor, as no more of the manga was ever adapted, uh, at least for this OVA. Yes, the mystery of the Bio Booster, Kronos, and the Zoa Lords remains unanswered, at least for now. Which I think is a true shame, because the Giver is a really fun time with plenty of unique character to help it stand apart from the crowd. While the animation may be passable at best for most of the OVA, it does have its moments where the dark atmosphere does a lot to help with that. Not to mention the gore is pretty fun without getting too gross. So if you're in the mood for a violent 80s action adventure show that has enough heart to get multiple adaptations, then The Giver is a good bet. Uh, just be aware that all of its on-screen iterations remain unfinished. Hey everyone, welcome to today's end card for this episode where we went over the Giver, the Bio Booster Armor. Let me go ahead and thank all my channel members for being with me here today, aka Batosai, Argent, Griever, Ashar, Kasar, Brian Sanchez, D Mels, Daniel Johnson, Detter V, Dilla Soul 22, Gert, Joe Castellanos, Joe Cabazos, John Lamb, Johnny G, Canto 20, McLean Nugent, Mr. Smash. Zappa Slave, Video Gamer 75, Trey Hardy, and Sindustries. Thank you all very much for being here. It has been a blast to make this video. And, uh, you know, the couple of bucks you guys throw my way really helps, especially when I'm sick after <laughs> after Christmas. And I'm, I'm still a little sick, so. I hope it wasn't too bad or too apparent in this video, although I feel like the energy was a little low on my end, unfortunately. Uh, so, anyway, what we got coming up for the rest of the month of January 2024 
is Broken Blade, then the first season of, uh, what is it, Gundam Build Fighters, and then after that, we have maybe the most requested show uh, ever, which is The Big O. So we're going to be doing a full look at The Big O at the end of the month. So stay tuned for that, but there's two more videos before that comes out. Uh, I Again, I hope you guys enjoyed this one. I hope you guys are looking forward to 2024 because there's going to be a lot of really cool stuff that comes out. So be on the lookout for that. Keep your eyes peeled. And uh, let's let's get this year going.